on Tuesday the 28th of August. We're coming very close to the halfway point now in our camp meeting. I hate to remind you of that because time goes by so swiftly at the camps, that does not. Now then, we'll come back to the story, which is uh, now moving on to the more definite stage in the development of the message. So far, that's more or less background or lead up to the actual building of a movement. Now, as I said at the close of our last study period, my presentation of this message began to generate, or not just my presentation, the general awakening to the message began to generate a very vicious backlash from the, from the church. And um, always being a very careful, responsible person, I wasn't prepared to continue preaching a message which the church uh, was so heavily against unless I had absolute proof it was from God. My study of church history warned me, of course, that um, when a lost message becomes, rec becomes recovered to an apostate people, that uh, the apostate people usually oppose the message and eventually it leads to separation. So I was prepared then for two different ways. One was for, my, for me to give up what I believed and the other was to cling to it and go in opposition to the church, depending on which was the truth in the matter. So I laid aside all activity in the um, sharing of the truths I had learned and experienced, saying to myself, I don't see how I alone can be the one person who has the truth in this, in this church and experienced men like the college principal and the church pastor, who was the same person, and these other able uh, leaders and teachers, how can they all be wrong and I be right? That's just not possible, I felt. So, for the next three months, I went into total seclusion or silence in regard to the message and studied very diligently day after day, not to prove myself right, but to prove myself wrong. Now, let me stress in doing this, um, I, in trying to prove myself wrong, I was, I was looking for all the evidence I could find that would reveal where I had gone astray, but the evidence had to be honest evidence. I wasn't going to prove myself wrong under any circumstances, but honestly and sincerely. And the more I studied, the more I found that Romans 6 verse 14 still said, sin shall not have dominion over you. And I couldn't change the words of the Desire of Ages 3.11 where a holy temper, a Christ-like life is accessible to every repenting, believing child of God. The words couldn't be changed. And I couldn't change um, other great Bible promises, but thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ, I couldn't change those words either. So the more I studied, the more I became confirmed in the fact that I had found living, saving truth. But still the doubt lingered until one Sabbath morning when I was a Sabbath school teacher and uh, I, I, was a, I was a Sabbath school teacher in pretty fair demand back in those days. I, I, did, I did have something for the people, naturally of course, with this message. And in the Sabbath school lesson this particular morning there was a text, Be you therefore perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now that was the red rag of the bull text back in those days. And you had but to mention that scripture and quote it when all the audience would bristle straight away. And um, Wesley makes the same observation in his little book, 44 Sermons. I've forgotten the exact words, I don't have the book here of course, but uh, he says if there's one word which gives offence to modern Christians, modern being the 1750, 60, 80, 90 Christians, he says that word perfect. And I said to myself, well, I said to myself, if I get up there and give a little discourse in perfection, I'm going to get a real bad response, so I'll be very cunning, I said to myself. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll stand up before them and I'll um, present this in a way that puts the, puts the responsibility back in their court. So I arrived at the Sabbath school class and to my, um, what shall I call it, not exactly consternation, but um, uh, anyway, that day the classroom was packed. Every single teacher was present. Cause I, they, gave, they gave me the teacher's class, the college teacher's class, because they, they supposed there would be less liable to contamination in, in the student class. <laughs> and the college, the college uh, principal, who was also the college um, minister, was there. Um, and all the teachers and their wives, the factory manager and his wife and, and everybody. And the room was jam-packed. 
When I came to the scripture which says, Be you therefore perfect, I said to the audience to look and I said, here's a, here's a text which has been the cause of much discussion and there's varying views as to what the text actually means. What do you folks say it means? And so I put the, the question back in their laps. And instantly, Brother Nilsson, who is the manager of the Sanitarium Health Food Factory, which is like Lemuel in the Foods in New Zealand, I uh, you know what Lemuel in the Foods is, is in California, that is down in New Zealand, and um, he said, well, Brother Wright, he said, uh, that doesn't mean we won't sin anymore. On the contrary, he said, we can rely upon the fact we shall sin every day. Rely upon it. But he said, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean we're defeated, we simply confess the sin and God forgives us and we go on and we remain his children. Well, <laughs> I forgot my caution at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> I just forgot my resolve and spontaneously I found myself saying, well then, what do these scriptures mean? And I began to quote out Lib Romans 6.14, Sin shall not have dominion, 1 Corinthians 15.57, 1 Thessalonians 3.3, 3, and so on and so on. And as these texts rolled off my tongue very, very fluidly, because I knew them so well, a deathly silence pervaded the room. You wouldn't believe how deathly silence the silence was. Not a soul stirred, not a word was spoken, and I just stood there waiting. <laughs> and then in the very centre of the classroom, Pastor Cranes, who was the uh, college president or principal as we call them and also the minister or the church the, 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 he was elder of Cranes, the church minister uh, and was regarded at that time as being the leading theologian in the Australasian division uttered these words and this is exactly what he said and he said Brother Wright he said he never lifted his head he kept looking at the floor we must be very careful not to uphold the standards so high as to discourage the people that wasn't so bad what comes next is really something. And then he said, I don't know what those scriptures mean which you just quoted, but this much I do know, they do not mean just what they say. <laughs> that was the end of my doubts. I never doubted again from that moment on. Because um, <clears throat> when the opponents of this message had to declare and the scripture didn't mean what it said and they had no more proof for anything. They, they swept away the one reliable book of evidence. It meant that when you read the Bible it didn't mean what it said so what's the point reading read it anyway? And from that moment on I lost all doubt and I launched myself, or I didn't launch myself, I let, I let the Lord use me as much as he wished in the battle to develop and present this glorious message. Now in the meantime, let's now forget my side of the story for a little while. Over in the United States, the General Conference of 1950, 50, yeah, 50, 1950 was being planned. And as is usual, they have a series of ministerial conferences before the General Conference sits in session. And at these ministerial conferences, they present... Uh, what they believe should be the emphasis on Adventist ministers preaching around the world. And present were two missionaries from South Africa whose names were Whelan and Short, names now famous, of course, in, uh, in modern Adventist church history. And these two men became deeply concerned as they noticed the trend in Adventist preaching at the ministerial institutes. And they recognised quite correctly that there was a drift, a very strong drift, toward evangelical preaching that the so-called Christ-centred preaching that was being advocated by the General Conference was really a Babylonian idol worship or hero worship, Christ being the idol, Christ the superstar. And uh, these two men talked and prayed together until they felt they ought to make a representation to the General Conference Committee. So they requested uh, an audience with the committee which they were given. And they then um, expressed their convictions that... Uh, the movement of the church was in the wrong direction, that it was willing and sure to have the true presentation of Jesus Christ, that the church should go back and repent of the mistake made in 1888 and take up that message, publish it, teach it and send it in books all around the world, the actual books of Wagner and Jones. Well, the leading brethren listened, and they listened, believe it or not, and uh, they... I must have experienced some measure of conviction because I said to these two men, very good, they said, we're interested. We'd like you to uh, put what you have just said into writing and we'll read it and give you our findings after we have read your presentation. So they assigned to Wheelan and Short um, time 
and I had some time for her to go back to Africa again. And they gave them a stenographers and a library to work from, and these two men worked, worked very hard for several months and produced a manuscript which is called 1888 Reexamined. It's now difficult to obtain. I think that Grothier has some copies, but he, he only gives them to the people that he thinks is not going to be, 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 be in this movement. I know when Andreas Dura wrote across to him to uh, get a copy, he wrote back and said he wouldn't send one unless he has certain assurances. Well, mm. uh, I saw a couple of those in the Loma Linda bookstore. You did really? Yeah, just mm. here and I've looked for that. That's interesting. Um, was it called 1888 Examined or Warnings Reception? No, it's 1888 yeah. Examined. Very good. There were two books. Um, the second one is the first one, plus further information, which I'll talk about in just a moment. Now, in this manuscript, the main point made by William and Short, and you can read extracts from that in our little publication called Christ Coming Delayed, Why? The main point made by William and Short was that in 1888, a deviation had taken place, a, a turning away from God's will, and until the present generation, any succeeding generation, was prepared to confess the mistake made back there and rectify the errors of that time, there could be no latter rain and no loud cry. That was the main point in William Short's presentation. And the General Conference Committee saw it. And in their reply, they, 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 they mentioned the fact that uh, throughout your manuscript they said you have emphasised this point. And then the General Conference Committee said, we do not believe that it is God's will for this generation to make uh, confession of or amends for the mistakes made by a previous generation. God never ever required that, so they said. Now, as I read to you yesterday from Leviticus 26 and verse 40, God does require that. Let's read the exact words again in the context of this particular story of the General Conference's statement. I, I stand absolutely amazed that men who profess to be students of God's word could claim that God never required such a confession when it is plainly written in Leviticus 26 and verse 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and what? the iniquity of their fathers with their trespass which they have trespassed against me and that also they have walked contrary unto me and that I also walked contrary unto them and have brought them into the land of their enemies if then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled <clears throat> and they then accept of the punishment of, of their iniquity then will I remember my covenant with Jacob and also my covenant with Isaac and also my covenant with Abraham will I remember and I will remember the land. So there's the, there's the requirement that God has made and no one, no one can truthfully say God never required that kind of confession because it's written there that he does. And of course we have the wonderful examples of... Um, King Hezekiah, if you read his uh, confession, after he'd um, uh, called for the restoration of temple services and the restoration of the Passover and so forth, he did confess the sins of his fathers and of himself. And so wonderfully were they blessed. They had a double camp meeting period of uh, an extra 10 days or so after they finished the Passover. And Ezra and Nehemiah likewise both confessed the sins of their fathers and so did Daniel in that wonderful prayer of Daniel chapter 9. And in each case, of course, wonderful blessings were received by those who made this obedient confession. As I said yesterday, such a confession does not involve sin specific sins committed by our fathers. If your father commits murder, you don't have to answer that or confess that. But if your father rejects God's truth, and brings you up in the same rejection and your, then his sin becomes your sin and you have to go right back to where you in him deviated from God's course, rectify that mistake made by your father or by yourself in your father and pick up the threads from there. And the General Conference Committee flatly refused to do, to do that. They denied any claim on God's part upon them in that direction. Now, no sooner had they taken the stand against the 1888 mission when they had a visit from two other men. Their names were Donald Barnhouse and... Uh, what was Martin's first name? Walter. Walter, Walter R. Martin and Donald... That's right. Walter R. Martin and Donald Barnhouse. And uh, these two men were very significant in the evangelical world of Sunday-keeping Protestants. <coughs> 
And they had been writing a series of books on the cults, Jehovah's Witnessism, Christian Science, Mormonism and so on. And now they planned to write one on the Seventh-day Adventists. And they came to the Adventist leaders and said, we want to be objective and truthful about our presentations. So before we write the book, we're going to ask you some specific questions. We'd like to have your answers and we'll write our book on the basis of your answers. And provided those answers, of course, are truthful and they are supported by uh, other evidence which we have. We believe you're not a Christian church. We believe you're a cult because you believe in salvation by works rather than in the merits of Christ and Christ alone. Well, um, this became a big thing in Adventist church history and a very significant development and um, lengthy discussions were held and the end result was that the Protestants concluded that the Seventh-day Adventists were Christians and the Adventists concluded that the Protestants were Christians and they were all brothers in Christ. And this was hailed by the church leaders, especially by Froome, Anderson, Reed and certain other top men in the Adventist echelon as um, a, a tremendous vindication of Adventism and a great new day for Adventism, the end of our alienation from the so-called Christian world around about us. Now, for those of us down in Australia and New Zealand who had experienced the power of the 1888 message and were faithful to the old-time principles, this was anything but a cause for rejoicing. Because when Babylon looks at your theology and says that you're a Christian as they are Christians, then that's a pretty bad comment, isn't it? And uh, I'd like to notice, for instance, in Volume 5 of the Testimonies, a statement made by Sister White um, in regard to um, the great separation which got established between the um, Seventh-day Adventist Church and the world. Page 455 in Volume 5. Uh, well, let, let me take, first of all, page 454. The Lord called out his people, Israel, and separated them from the world he might commit to them a sacred trust. That, that was ancient Israel. Now, on page 455, we have the parallel. God has called his church in this day, as he called ancient Israel to, to, to stand as a light in the earth. By the mighty cleaver of truth... <coughs> <clears throat> the messages of the first, second and third angels he has separated them from the churches and from the world to bring them into a sacred nearness to himself now when the seventh Adventist church had the third angels message in verity what was it uh, but a mighty cleaver to divide them from the Protestant world now as the years have gone by as you can read from Great Controversy page 389 the Protestant churches have fallen lower and lower so that they're further and further away from God. And it was God's plan that the Seventh-day Adventist church should climb higher and higher and draw nearer and nearer to Him. We read the words in the book Great Controversy, page 3, 390, to make that point clear and plain. Page 389, rather. And here it says, The second angel's message, Revelation 14, was first preached in the summer of 1844 and it then had a more direct application to the Church of the United States where the warning of the judgment had been most widely proclaimed and most generally rejected and where the declension in the Church has been most rapid. But the message of the second angel did not reach its complete fulfillment in 1844. The Church has then experienced a moral fall in consequence of their refusal of the light of the Advent message but that fall was not complete as they have continued to reject the special truths for this time, they have fallen lower and lower. Now then, the facts are that the Protestant churches have fallen lower and lower and lower since 1844. The, the Adventist church claims to have climbed higher and higher and higher since 1844. So what about, so if the gulf was so wide back in 44, what, must have, what, should, what would it be today? Great, much, much wider. So therefore, if the gulf is narrowed, if it comes to a place where the Protestants and Adventists can actually stretch their hands across that gulf and join hands and come together in unity, then it's the Adventist church which has moved toward the Protestants, not the Protestants toward the Adventists. There's been no reformation in the Protestant churches because they have fallen lower and lower. The, the sure the prophecy says so. Therefore, without question, the gulf should have been much wider 
And when the Protestant churches said to the Adventists in the, in the mid-1950s, we now, see that the, we now see that by virtue of the changes which you have made, you are a Christian church, the Adventists should have said, oh no, are we that bad? Have we gone that far? Have we fallen so deep that those men could say that? That's what they should have said. That's, that's what we said who had picked up the 1888 message and um, we, we were positively alarmed. And it's amazing to me <clears throat> how, how religionists, will, apostate religions, will totally ignore the lessons of history. Now go back to ancient Israel and we find that there was a revival and reformation and, and the gulf between them and the Baal worship was, was very wide and deep. But then the time came when they began to co-worship with the Baal worshippers again and every time they did, they, they experienced God's disapproval and suffered terrible destruction from plagues or other destructive means. And so there was great rejoicing in the Adventist world as they now had received from the Protestant world this acclamation, this acceptance, this recognition that they were a Christian church. And if you want full documentary evidence of this, just read Froome's book entitled The Movement of Destiny. And don't fail to read our book after it, The Destiny of the Movement, will you? It'll get the balance for you. But in that book, uh, The Movement of Destiny, Froome has detailed all this history and shows how, in consequence of great changes made in Adventist theology, um, and, and he has the nerve to claim, of course, that these changes are the fruit of Wagner and Jones's message, which, but they're really the very opposite of it. The Protestant churches hail the Adventists as being a Christian church. Now, in the meantime, down in New Zealand, the president of the New Zealand Conference was a man named R.A. Grieve and uh, he was very much an evangelical and prior to the meetings in America between Barnhouse and Martin and the Adventist leaders he was already coming to the same conclusions uh, that the Adventist leaders were coming to with the Protestant leaders and he absolutely hailed with excitement the American development. Now R.A. Grieve believed in one apart from the heavenly sanctuary he believed that perfection over a perfection of character was impossible you could not have victory over sin that the spirit prophecy was reliable only in certain places and was filled with many, many errors. And especially it was an error over the sanctuary message and the 2,200 days and the heavenly ministry of Jesus Christ. And he began to vigorously preach these things in, in New Zealand, especially as he became aware of what was happening over in the United States of America. And he kind of ran ahead of things a bit and spoiled things a bit for the new movement. <clears throat> now in the meantime, back in the United States of America, um, the um, General Conference Committee said to Wilden and Short, now we admit that it could be that God has prompted your, your proposal to us, it could be that God does want the message of Wagner and Jones proclaimed around the world, and we are prepared now to absolutely leave this thing completely in God's care. And we'd like to test it in this manner and we're asking you to go back to your mission station and say no more about the matter whatsoever and we, will, and we likewise will let the thing rest and we'll leave it in God's care and if he wants to thing before the people he'll bring it through another channel or another means. And we'll, we'll ensure so that's, that's a good proposition, we accept that and they went back to Africa to continue their mission service. Now it so happened that they had prepared 30 copies of the manuscript. They felt that was a good number to um, give one to each of the members. They, they all had their individual copy and so on. And uh, as soon as this proposition was made, the General Commerce Committee really went to great lengths to ensure that they had um, caged each one of those 30 copies, locked it up. But they couldn't find the 30th one. 29, but not the 30th. That's all it takes is one seed to, to spread a big tree, doesn't it? And that 30th copy found its way from the east to the west. It wound up in Los Angeles and um, there was a, a sister there, I've forgotten her name now, who read the book through and saw its great significance and promptly sent it to Al Hudson, whom she knew in Baker, Oregon. Now Al Hudson has a printing press and printing presses are dreadful dangerous things. <laughs> <laughs> they multiply error like leaves of autumn but they also print the truth like leaves of autumn. So they're deadly and they're wonderful. And um, Al Hudson read the manuscript through and I think he was already, his mind was already moving along these same lines 
So he prepared a very careful brief or a letter which he then presented with the manuscript to the local church asking them to present this to the conference which they did. The conference passed the buck on to the union, it to the division and so it came back full circle to the general conference again and to the alarm of the general conference committee they realised that one copy was out there in circulation in the hands of a very individualistic kind of person named Al Hudson whom they couldn't trust to keep this thing quiet and he didn't. But they, they took the attitude all the way down, down this uh, chain of command from the general conference to the division, the union, the local church to Al Hudson that they wanted nothing to do with this manuscript whatsoever. So Al Hudson then decided that he was going to, um, to um, uh, put this thing before the church. He felt he was in harmony with the council and the Bible. If you brought it, if you brought it against your brother, go to him first and if he doesn't hear, go to two or three, take two or three more and finally then take it before the entire church and this is what he's about to do. So he printed thousands of copies, that's why I first got my copy. Now his copy is not called 1888 Reexamined, it is called A Warning and Its Reception. And it contains 1888 Reexamined plus the General Conference Answers or Answer, Will Ensure's Second Presentation and the General Conference's Second Answer. And it's a much more valuable document than the simple 1888 re-examined which is what is more or less available today. Now let's go back to Australia now and um, I remember I said before that John Martin, Bob Brinsmead and others had found these manuscripts in the college library. Let's detail that story now because because all these various stories come together now in a in the developing movement. I understand that uh, one day the college librarian said to two or three young men, amongst them was John Slade and I think Bob Brinsmead, uh, go down to the old college storeroom and you'll find there are a number of books which have been taken out of the shelves over the years and dumped there pending further assessment and I want you to go through them and decide if there's anything valuable that you probably, you probably won't find anything valuable throw out what isn't valuable and keep the rest and of course this is where Wagner and Jones's books had ended up gathering dust and cobwebs in this old storeroom they hadn't been on the shelves because I'd never seen them when I was in college and the young men went there and began to go through the books. You know, it's like going through boxes of old books. You don't get very far, do you? You <laughs> start reading here and reading there. And um, very soon they found themselves poring over Consecrated Way, Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection and Wagner's Book of Romans and the Book of Hebrews and General Conference uh, Bulletins and so on. And, they, and they, they, they just came alive. They, they just felt that here was a real and living message. And somehow or the other, these young men already had some inkling of the 1888 history and they knew the names of Wagner and Jones. And so they eagerly collected all these Wagner and Jones's books and took them out of the storeroom to their rooms. They didn't give them to the librarian. They, knew, they seemed to know better than to do that. And uh, they read them and quite a nice revival began to develop in the school as a result. The church still being unaware of what was happening and they sent manuscript, they sent the books home to Queensland where a certain Dr. Boyd, um, a medical doctor, trained at Loma Linda, I believe, uh, also caught the significance of these volumes and uh, engaged a typist to make typewritten copies on stencils which were then run through a Gestetner uh, duplicator and, and uh, bound together rather roughly. It was extremely poor typing, they must have had a real amateur typist because there were numerous spelling mistakes and hardly any margins, they would crowd the words up against the left hand and right hand margins, sometimes running over the edge of the page. But they were the message just the same and um, very soon these copies began to appear in different people's uh, homes and they were read by eager readers here and there and everywhere and some copies were sent, were sent down to New Zealand. And by this time the church began to be aware of what was happening and believe me, they, they certainly rose up in alarm and did their uttermost to suppress these writings. And anybody who was in possession of a, uh, a manuscript by Wagner, by Wagner or Jones was instantly labelled dangerous. Really watch that man, he's dangerous. That was the message which went around. And if you wanted to stay in good favour with the church, you hid your Wagner and Jones books out of sight and read them in the dark of night when no one, watched, when, when no one could see you. Of course some folks didn't care, they just read them any time, anywhere and they were the ones who were blacklisted in the church right away. And uh, so down in Australia we find that quite independent of what was happening up here in North America there is a, a, a rediscovery of the Wagner and Jones material 
while at the same time Will and his children were calling for the rediscovery of the books over there. So we have two independent streams which came together in one fusion later on. And that to me is a very strong argument in favour of this history because always, well take for instance the 1844 movement, simultaneously in the old and new world, quite unknown to each other, the interest in the 2,300 days and the second coming of Christ was generated. In, in Sweden, for instance, the child preachers proclaim the message of Revelation 14, 6, 6 and 7. In England, there was a man called Henry Drummond. In South America, there was Rabbi Ben Ezra, who was uh, Lacunza, the Roman Catholic priest. Joseph Wolfe was travelling the length and breadth of Europe and finally even came to America. And over here, there was, of course, William Miller and his, and his friends. We generally accent, of course, the work of William Miller above the others, but just the same, they were all there working independent, independently of each other, springing up at the same time, and that's, that is a, uh, a pattern of God's working in revival, in revival work. And so we found, too, that uh, in several different parts of the world, there was a rediscovery, a reawakening of interest in the Wagner and Joseph material at the same point of time, which, which demonstrates that the Spirit of God was working and not some mind or some human mind behind the scenes. Now, <clears throat> at this time, in the late 50s, about 58, the Brinsmead family began to gain prominence as uh, the main spokesman of this general stirring here, uh, not here but in Australia, and in turn in New Zealand, and later, of course, in America as well. At that time, Bob Brinsme was a student at the, at the Australasian Missionary College, now called Avondale College. They've taken the missionary out of the name. And uh, he wrote a paper entitled The Vision of the Hadekel, about the King of the North and the King of the South. And uh, circulated this, and it was a very good paper. I, uh, the, the, the basic fundamental principles outlined in that paper were very sound, because he demonstrated the King of the North was not Russia, as uh, some people suppose, nor the kings of the earth, kings of the East rather, were not Japan, China, India and so on, nor was the King of the South literal Egypt, but the King of the North he recognised to be uh, the papacy or Babylon, the King of the South, Egypt or atheism, and the kings from the East, Christ and his returning armies at the end of uh, this world's history. And the presentation was very good, I still have a copy at home and, and uh, I haven't read it for years now, but uh, I really enjoyed the principles that were in that book. Now that when that got around, of course, it was, it was rejected by the theological teachers and Bob Brinsley, Bob Brinsley became a marked man. Then Bob Brinsley made connection with Al Hudson over here in America. Letters began to flow back and forth and the church tri triumphant began to appear. I can't just give you dates today for the start of all these things. It was around about 58, 59 and 60, I know. And <coughs> Bob Benjamin was expelled from the college because of his uh, views and because he was uh, contaminating the school with his errors. <laughs> Put that in quotation marks, won't you? And uh, once he was, once he was um, um, expelled from the school, he became even more active. His sister, Hope Taylor, up in Brisbane, joined him and so did his brother, John Brinsmead. And they wrote a number of books uh, called Weight in the Balances, uh, God's Eternal Purpose, um, Through the Open Door. What were some of the others? Remember some of the other books back in those days? That's, that's three or four of the main ones, right? The Open Door, Weight in the Balances. Um, okay, they're, they're the main ones. Little pamphlets printed by commercial printers and these were distributed by the tens of thousands. And the... Um, the Seventh-day Adventist Church leaders did their absolute best to refute Bob Brinsmead's teaching, but the, the harder they tried, the more they demonstrated their own ineptitude, their own inability to do so, and the more they strengthened Bob Brinsmead's cause, and the more they convinced me that they, they were wrong and he was right. For instance, this is the kind of thing that happened. Um, Pastor Batty, who was then a retired president of the, of the trans... Tasman Union Conference, which embraced New South Wales and New Zealand, came across to Longburn College and gave a series of lectures in the school. And he said to the students, now look, he said, let me tell you something very straight and plain. The sanctuary is not important. Don't worry about it, he said. It's a deep theological subject. It's too deep for the average young mind. All you have to do is to make sure that every day you're right with God and in the great judgment day you'll be saved. Now, that's real heresy. <laughs> 
because thank you. I mean, a few days later, um, I should mention that at, at this by this time there was quite a circle of students, quite a group of students who were coming to my home for Bible studies, and. Um, we, we spent a lot of time with the sanctuary message and the students had no difficulty understanding it at all. None whatsoever. It wasn't, it wasn't too deep for them. And one of them was a girl named Joyce Miller. She, oh, I'm not sure where she came from now, but uh, somewhere in the North Island of New Zealand. And she came with the other young men and young women to my home. We studied the, the message together. And um, one day, shortly after Pastor Batty had made the statement, Pastor Kranz, the college president, saw her alone in the college library and, and he knew that she was listening to me. So he stepped in and said to her, Joyce, he said, have you been troubled about the, the sanctuary question? She said, well, I have, she said, somewhat. Well, look, he said, and then he repeated Pastor Batty's statement, don't worry about it, it's not important. So she came across to my place and said, I want to ask you a question. And this is a loaded question, believe me. She said, is the sanctuary important? Well, actually, she had, first of all, she told me what Pastor Kranz had said. And I knew if I had said, look, Pastor Kranz is wrong, I'd be really in trouble. <laughs> One of those situations where you had to be as wise as a serpent, wise as two or three serpents. And uh, I said, look, Joyce, I said, I'm not going to tell you what I think. I'm not going to criticize what Pastor Kranz says. I'm going to read you what the Word of God says, and uh, you can make up your own mind. And whatever you do, I said, don't go away from me and say, Fred Wright, said so and so go away from me and say the word of God said so and so and I read to her from Great Controversy page 488 488 where Sister White says those who would share the benefits of the Saviour's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness and the fear of God the precious hours instead of being given to pleasure to display the gain seeking should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the Word of God. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the positional work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs them to fill. Every individual has a soul to save or to lose. Each is a case pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge face to face. How important then that every mind contemplate often the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit and the books shall be opened, when with Daniel every individual must stand in his light at the end of his days. All who have received the light upon this, these subjects are to bear testimony to, of the great truth which God has committed to them. The sanctuary in heaven is the very centre of Christ's work on behalf of men. It concerns every soul living upon the earth. It opens to view the plan of redemption, bringing us down to the very close of time and revealing the triumphant issue of the contest between righteousness and sin. It is of the utmost importance that all should thoroughly investigate these subjects and be able to give an answer to, to everyone that asks them a reason of the hope that is in them. Now, I couldn't have given the girl a better answer, could I? Impossible. But I stressed to her, I said, now look, please, I said, that's what the Word of God says. And I said, don't go away from me and say, Brother Wright says Pastor Kranz is all wrong. Don't do that. I said, you tell people what the Word of God says. She went away. The next thing I knew, the whole school was saying, Fred Wright said Pastor Kranz is lost. <laughs> 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 and I was in trouble then. <laughs> I didn't say any such thing, I, I simply read to her what the Word of God had to say. So, so I had to give an answer, I just couldn't say, look, I, want, I don't want to get my fingers burnt, don't ask me that question, I had to give an answer. That was my responsibility before God and the consequences, of course, were, were God's consequences and I had to leave that with Him. And the wonderful thing was that even though the um, rumour, the erroneous rumour got round the school and, was, and got back to Pastor Kranz himself, it didn't cause me any trouble really. God protected me very wonderfully and uh, nothing was said about it until the very, very close of the actual year itself. So then um, Bob Wesley came to New Zealand in 1960, I believe it to have been. And that was my very last year at the college, a very dramatic year, which I'll talk about in our next session together. And uh, I think uh, in nine, somewhere in 1960 he came to America for the first time joined up with Al Hudson and uh, 
went before the General Conference Committee, presented his findings to them, and of course got nowhere at all. Unfortunately, in a way, although not really, Bob had at that time, uh, just as William Miller did, William Miller had the wrong concept about the sanctuary, and Bob had a certain wrong concept about the sanctuary too, which was corrected later, just as Miller's error was also corrected later, and that concerned the blotting out of sin. And he taught as the shepherd's rod did before him, uh, with which group he had some connection, that uh, at the time when the image of the beast is formed, the judgment of the living takes place for Adventists only at that point. They are then given the final seal, the latter rain is poured upon them, and then they go out to win the world as a finally sealed people. And the judgment then progressively takes care of those who are won to the gospel during that period of time. So by the end of probationary time, both the Adventists, both the faithful Adventists and the, un, and, and, and the people of the outside will all receive the seal of God and the work finally closes up. We have learnt, of course, in the meantime, that uh, this is not a truly scriptural position, that the latter rain precedes the judgment of the living and none of us will get the final seal until we have passed the great final test, which is the death to create the end of probationary time. We won't, of course, detail all those those points today. They'll come out in the order of last event study eventually when we get that book written. But we learned that, of course, and we but we also understood quite correctly that Bob Brinsby's position was a natural extension of the errors which has crept into the Adventist Church subsequent to the rejection of life back in 1888. And just very, very briefly, that error was that... Um, the 1888 message is built upon the principle that sin is what we are. Sin is an entity. Sin is a presence within the person. It is a spirit, a living spirit, that dominates us against our will. Now, such a spirit can be transferred to the sanctuary. And it is in the experience of a true believer. But um, when in 1888 the leaders rejected the message, they rejected that principle, and sin was then reduced to being nothing more than what we do, and, um, of course, you can't transfer an action, but you can transfer the guilt of it. So, therefore, the transfer of sin became the transfer of guilt. And, therefore, the blotting out of sin became the blotting out of, of a record of guilt instead of the actual removal of the sin itself. And Bob Brinsmith's position was a natural extension of that error. And once that error was corrected, of course, then the mistake made by Brinsmith's teaching was very plainly and clearly seen by those of us and the, when the corrections were made, we made good progress on the way. Well, time has gone again. Um, 45 minutes seems to get shorter every year, doesn't it? So we'll stop at this point and uh, continue this theme again this afternoon. Any questions you'd like to ask on this presentation so far?